Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network and I wanted to welcome everyone here today. Uh, that this webinar is co-sponsored by the EBM Tools Network as well as Open Channels and we have Nick Weiner on who is representing Open Channels and um, I'd like to particularly welcome our presenters today, Lauren Long and David Bietenbaugh from the NOAA Office for Coastal Management. They are going to be speaking to us today about tools to plan for hazard resilience and climate change. Um, a couple of things I wanted to let everyone know before we get started. There will be initial presentation and demonstration of the, of the web tools and then that's going to be followed by a question and answer period. So there's two ways to ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand, it's a little hand icon in the user interface right on the side. You can raise your virtual hand, I'll unmute you and you can ask the question directly to Lauren and David during the question and answer. Uh, portion of the webinar, or um, at any time during the webinar, now middle of the presentation, at the end, you could type questions in the question panel of the user interface. Um, substantive stuff will we'll save till the question and answer period, but clarification questions I could go ahead and, and direct to uh, Lauren and David during the webinar. Uh, in, if that will facilitate uh, understanding the webinar. So. Um, we, we really encourage people to ask questions. We like to make this as interactive as possible. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Lauren and David, for being here. I'll turn it over to you now. All right, great. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, like Sarah mentioned, we're going to be talking about tools to plan for hazards, resilience, and climate change. But before we get started, we'll just quickly um, introduce ourselves a bit more. Let's see if I can. There we go. Um, so my name is Lauren Long and I work as a coastal conservation specialist for NOAA's Office for Coastal Management in Charleston, South Carolina. And I work on hazards resilience, climate adaptation, and green infrastructure projects, helping to develop products, deliver trainings, and provide technical assistance to coastal managers. And I'll let David introduce himself. You might have to take yourself off mute, David. Or we can let David introduce himself before he gets started. Yeah, why don't we go on, Lauren? We'll, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and go on. Um, okay, so at NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, we're really about building capacity in coastal managers to understand where communities are at risk from coastal hazards and how they can use green infrastructure to reduce those impacts. And it's been a really exciting year for us, and we have several new products that we wanted to show you today. So first, I'm going to provide a little bit of context around coastal hazards and then talk about a product that can help you assess your community's exposure to coastal flood hazards. And then David's going to talk about using green infrastructure to reduce hazard impacts and a few products that can help support those efforts. So why are coastal communities concerned about coastal hazards and talking about green infrastructure? Well, as all of you know, coastal communities face huge challenges in planning for greater disaster resilience. And this map shows that coastal communities in particular face increasing risk from extreme coastal storms like Katrina, Sandy, and Isaac because of increasing populations and of course the associated built infrastructure that is in harm's way. And population trends indicate that the U.S. coast will see population grow from 123 million in 2010 to nearly 134 million in 2020, again, increasing the incidence of these costly extreme events. And Hurricane Katrina in 2005 had damage estimates over 96 billion, and then post-tropical Cyclone Sandy had esti damage estimates over $65 billion, so a lot of money being spent on these damages, too. And um, these are probably images familiar to a lot of you now. The pictures on the left are showing impacts from post-tropical Cyclone Sandy, and then the images on the right are showing coastal green infrastructure absorbing some of those impacts. Of course, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a house there as well, so you have a little bit of infrastructure, but you can see um, the green areas also providing some protection. So a lot of you who live along the coast know that you're exposed to coastal flood hazards, but to help coastal communities better understand how exposed they are to these different flood hazards and to be able to visualize this exposure and start conversations about how they're going to reduce those risks, we developed the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper, which is the tool I wanted to show you today. And the tool was really designed to be non-technical, very easy to use, 
Um, and it was designed to show maps where people, places, and natural resources are exposed to coastal flooding for a chosen location. So the goal of the tool is to really help local planners start conversations in their communities about hazard risks by providing maps that they can save and print and bring to community planning meetings or add to a meeting presentation or pull this up live during a community meeting. And the product is currently available for the coastal counties along the East Coast and Gulf of Mexico. And we do have plans this year to talk about expansion, which could include the Great Lakes, West Coast, Caribbean, Pacific Islands. So if your area is not covered, please share with us your needs around having this, a type of tool like this um, in your location because it will help us prioritize where to go next. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the web so I can um, show you a live version of the tool. So now you should be seeing um, the web interface. So you can access the tool on NOAA's Digital Coast website, which is what you see up here on the screen. And this is where we house most of our tools, data, training, case studies. And the website also hosts products from our Digital Coast partners. So you can find a whole host of things on this website. And everything that we talk about today is available on our Green Infrastructure Topics page. That's just here at the top. And we'll provide the URL at the end of the presentation so that you don't have to write down individual URLs if you don't want to. So everything that Dave and I are going to talk about is going to be located there. So I'm going to go ahead and launch into the tool by hitting the Get It Now button. And again, the idea behind this product is that the different flood exposure maps can be collected and brought to community planning meetings to start discussions around hazard risks and vulnerabilities. So I'm going to go ahead and start collecting maps. And I'll accept the disclaimer, um, which mainly talks about this being a screening level tool because like many of our products, all of the maps that you're going to see show nationally available screening level spatial data. So it's really meant to be a conversation starter in hopes that people will might maybe do some more detailed analysis with some of their own local data. Um, and here you're on the select page where you can decide whether you want to look at flood hazards or you want to look at societal infrastructure and ecosystem exposure to those flood hazards. We usually tell folks to start with flood hazards because it gives you a good understanding of the different flood hazards included in the tool that you can then overlay on top of those other maps. So let's go ahead and start there. So I'll click on flood hazards. And now you're on the map page. And you can see the workflow along the top. So we were just on the select tab. Now we're in the map tab. And then I'll take you to the collect tab here in a little bit. So in, in this section, you can create a collection of maps of flood hazards to save and then later share with others. And you can select your location here from the drop-down. Again, we have East Coast and Gulf areas available. And for this example, I'm going to select Alabama and Mobile County. So it zooms me into that area. And then I can zoom in um, a little bit further to get to where I really want to be. So you can set your extent, whether you want to zoom out or zoom in, however, whatever makes sense for what you're doing. And there are several maps in, this, in the flood hazards section that you can see along the side. You can look at shallow coastal flooding, FEMA flood zones, storm surge, sea level rise, or a composite view, which is what you're looking at here as the default. And this basically combines all of these hazards to show areas where I might be exposed to one or more of those flood hazards. And I'll go ahead and open the legend so you can see what it looks like. So the areas in dark red are going to be areas with the flood hazards, and the areas in the lighter colors are going to be areas with the least flood hazards. And you can click anywhere on the map to get information of how many hazards you have in a specific location and which ones those are. And you can also change the base map. So if you don't want to look at the gray base map, you can change it to satellite, which is usually why I like what I prefer to look at. So we'll, we'll, look, we'll look at that one from, from now on. And then on the left side of the map, you can click on the icons to get some more information about uh, what you're looking at and why. So you just click on the icon and it tells you a little bit information about the map that you're specifically looking at. So I'm just going to kind of show you some of the functions before I go into the details. And then you can save the map to your collection by clicking on the green button in the upper right hand corner. And as you start collecting maps, you'll see that the count over here on the right will change. So if you want to see what you've been collecting so far, you can just click on that. And it shows you a quick view of just some thumbnails of all the maps that you've been collecting so far. 
And then information about the data used in all the maps is linked from the bottom of every page here in the lower left-hand corner. Um, so I'll go ahead and open that up so you can see that. So for every section of map, you can see it's organized by section, and then you're going to have each the name of each of the data layers, a description, um, a link to the map service online, the authoritative source. And again, this is really designed to be non-technical and not require any GIS expertise. But in case someone wants to do some additional analysis, we, you know, we provided the link to the map service. So you can do that online. And we also provide instructions um, for using the map services in ArcGIS.com in case someone wanted to pull in some of our map services and some of their own um, map services and create some custom maps. They can do it that way. So I'll go ahead and go back to the map, and then um, I'll just and then you can also I'll point out that the map services there's a quick link here in the bottom left corner as well, if you want to just get straight to that. So I'll just quickly just turn on some of the other data layers in this section. So we have shallow coastal flooding, so you can see the areas susceptible areas in red, and then in the information about this map we also embedded an, a quick animation that talks a little bit more about shallow coastal flooding. Um, then we have FEMA flood zones with the high risk in the red, moderate risk in orange. We have storm surge. And in this um, description, we also have embedded uh, a little quick draw that we worked with the National Weather Service on. So you can watch that. And I'll point out, you know, we're, what we're seeing here are areas that are most exposed in red and then least exposed in the lighter colors. So for storm surge category one, those areas are going to be red because those areas are the most exposed. Those areas are going to be exposed to not only category one, but also two through five. Then we also have sea level rise, which is from our sea level rise viewer. Again, areas exposed to one feet. Um, one foot of sea level rise are going to be exposed to two through six, so those areas are going to be most exposed and in that red. So to view societal infrastructure or ecosystem maps, you can choose from the drop-down or um, the drop-down right here or go, go back to the select tab. I'll just go ahead and choose here from the drop-down. So here I get maps showing societal characteristics of my location that could be exposed to coastal flood hazards. And this is an example of um, society, and a societal exposure map showing population density, so people per square mile, with the light tan with being the least people per square mile and the dark tan, dark brown being the most. And then if I overlay FEMA flood zones on top of that, you can see the red areas being high risk and then the orange areas being moderate risk. And now you can see the flood, the flood hazards are available along the top as icons that you can easily toggle on and off. And then one, one thing we do like to do is, I'll just go ahead and save this map. And then one thing we like to do is then turn the hazard layer off and save the map. And so then if I look at these little thumbnails, you're going to have two different maps. And you can see one map with the hazard layer, one map without, and do some comparison that way. They have kind of a better look of what you have underneath those hazards and see what population densities could be at risk. And then I won't go into detail about the other maps in this section, but I'll just point out that some other maps include poverty, elderly, employees, and projected population growth. And then if you're interested in um, looking at infrastructure exposure, you can just drop down, select infrastructure exposure. And in this section, you get a few different choices. You get maps showing development, critical facilities, and development patterns from 1996 to 2011. And the example on the screen is showing development. So you have the dark gray is going to be the higher intensity development and the lighter gray being the less intense development. And then again, you can easily toggle on and off any of the hazards um, along the top. So I'll go ahead and just turn on um, sea level rise scenario. So here you're seeing developed areas and potential exposure to sea level rise of one through six feet. And then I'll go ahead and just save this map so we can get a little collection going. And again, I won't go through all of the different uh, maps in here for the sake of time, but um, I will show you now the ecosystem exposure section. So that's the last section of maps. And the one I usually like to show the most is the protection um, map. So I just turned that on. And here you're viewing natural areas along with development. So you're seeing wetlands in the dark green, 
um, beaches and dunes and tan, which there aren't any in this location, so you can't you know, see any on, on the map, and then other natural areas and open space in the light green, along with development. So again, the higher intensity in the dark gray to lower, lower intensity in the lighter gray. And then if I turn on storm surge scenarios, you're now seeing, again, the dark red being the areas most exposed, so those exposed to category one through five, um, and then the, the yellowish, orangish areas being the least exposed. So I think this map does a good job helping you visualize where you have existing natural resources that can provide protection to de those developed areas from storm surge. Um, and again, I'll go ahead and save this map. And like I mentioned before, you know, turning off the hazard layer and saving it again allows you to have a little bit more of a comparison between the two maps to see what you what you have on the ground. And then the other maps in this in this section include one with just the natural areas and the open space, and then another one showing natural areas and open space and potential pollution sources that could impact those natural resources if they're exposed to those flood hazards. So now that we've take, we've got had a, have a pretty good collection of maps going, we'll go ahead and go to the collect tab. And on this page, you can view all of the maps you've saved. Um, so little thumbnails of all the maps that you've saved. And you have a unique URL for each map that you can see. And you can share that with folks. So um, I'll just go ahead and copy it and show you what that looks like on the web. So it's going to be that specific map. So it's a unique URL for that map. Um, so you can email it to somebody or however you want to do it. You can also just click view the map and you can view uh, the map online as well. And then you can also print the map. So if you want to print your entire collection of maps that you just created, you can select print and you'll get the legend for each map. And then again, you see that unique URL. So that's always going to persist for that map. So you can always get back to it. And it's going to just provide you a little collection of all the maps. And it looks a little bit weird on my screen right now because I have a very wide screen. But when you print this on an eight, eight and a half by 11, you'll see that um, that white space goes away. And this will this will look a little bit more normal. But I just have a wide screen that I'm using for the demo. And one thing that I just will know is that because we don't require a username and password, your maps won't be saved once you leave the site. So make sure that you save the URLs or print the PDF so that you have them so you can get back to them if you want to. Um, since these won't be here any longer when you leave. And then I'll also point out that we have um, some tips for using these maps with your community that includes information about engaging stakeholders, some different questions you might want to use to help facilitate conversation around the maps, and some additional information on um, additional data sets you might want to use that we don't include in the tool. There's also resources um, for helping you continue assessing uh, your risks and vulnerabilities. And then there's case studies about how other communities are assessing their risks and vulnerabilities using this type of approach. We also have an FAQ up here if you have any questions. Hopefully it will be answered in there. And if, it's, if you have a question that you can't find the answer to in the FAQ, please let us know because we're constantly trying to update that and make sure it's um, as robust as it needs to be for folks. So please let us know if you uh, don't find something in there that you need. And then um, that was basically the tour I wanted to take you uh, um, on for the tool. But now I just want to quickly show, uh, share an example about how the Jacques Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve and Rutgers University are using the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper to plan for resiliency in their coastal New Jersey communities. So as we all know, New Jersey was impacted by post-tropical cyclone Sandy, which prompted New Jersey coastal communities to start really engaging in resiliency planning to be better prepared for the next storm event. So the Jacques Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve and Rutgers University created a website called NJ Adapt that houses resources that can help these communities with their resiliency planning. And the Coastal Hazard Profiler, the first resource you see listed here that's circled under Quick Links, um, it's actually an adaptation of the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper that you just saw demonstrated. Um, and they're using that to assess community risks and vulnerabilities. 
So basically they had some local data they, that they wanted to use in their planning, so we worked with them to use our tool and customize it to include their data with ours. Um, and they had development capabilities to do this, so basically we just shared our code with them and they customized the tool and they've been using it to help New Jersey communities assess their risks and vulnerabilities and, and help these communities gain credits through FEMA's community rating system to reduce their flood insurance premiums. And this looks a little bit different than the version I just showed you because when we worked with them, we weren't completely finished with our version, so they're using a slightly older version of the tool. But it still works essentially the same. And the reserve is working with communities to use these maps as they go through an online self-assessment process called Getting to Resilience. Um, and they're helping them get this information into their community plans. And they're also working with communities to help them implement green infrastructure strategies to help you know, reduce these hazard, the hazard risks that they identified in their assessment process. So this is a good example of how you could use the mapper in your community resilience planning efforts, whether you want to use the mapper as is or you want to you know, use the development code to do some customization. I also mentioned the map services that are available too, so if you wanted to create your own maps online, you could do some customization that way as well. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to David to talk about using green infrastructure to reduce coastal hazard impacts and some of the, the resources we have to support that. So, Great. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome. Can you hear Maybe me now? You. Yep, we can hear you, David. Great. Thank you. I apologize for the hiccup earlier and the radio silence. I actually lost um, oh. audio connection right before we went live. Um, so anyways... Thanks, Lauren. That was great. And uh, I'll go ahead and take this opportunity to introduce myself. I am David Beatenbaugh. I'm a geospatial analyst here at the Office for Coastal Management. I've been working here, I uh, sit in the office um, in, located in Charleston, South Carolina, along with Lauren. And I've been working at the office for about five and a half years now, uh, providing GIS support to develop and maintain um, coastal resilience-related pro um, products, much like we are going to see today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, as Lauren has shown us, the flood exposure mapper was designed to help coastal communities assess exposures to, coast, uh, to coastal flood hazards. And the product I will highlight was designed to help communities reduce impacts from flood hazards. So this fits a little later in the resilience building timeline, typically after communities have finished the risk assessment and begun implementing solutions. So specifically, I'm going to highlight a relatively new product that we created um, to help communities map and prioritize areas for green infrastructure projects. Now, in our office, when we talk about green infrastructure, we talk about incorporating both the existing natural environment as well as constructed or man-made systems that mimic natural processes and developing an integrated network that benefit, benefits both nature and people. And I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but green infrastructure can provide an array of benefits that can contribute to the environmental, social, and economic well-being of communities. And one benefit in particular of green infrastructure that has been the focus of much attention in the past several years is the potential reduction in flood impacts. So green infrastructure practices can range from conserving land at a larger landscape or watershed scale to incorporating site scale low impact development or implementing techniques at the shoreline such as dune or oyster reef restoration. And I'm not going to go into detail about different green infrastructure techniques, but I am going to talk about that new product, the Green Infrastructure Mapping Guide that we recently released that focuses on landscape scale green infrastructure planning. So here we are seeing a, um, a screenshot from the homepage on the Digital Coast, this is the, the homepage for the Green Infrastructure Mapping Guide. And when working at the landscape scale for green infrastructure and conservation, an important part of the initial work is identifying and prioritizing appropriate areas to target for acquisition and project siting. And when communities are often working on tight budgets, they really want to get the most bang for their buck, or the most benefit for their buck, if you will. And mapping can be a powerful tool for identifying and prioritizing those target areas. So again, here we are looking at the screen grab or the homepage for the Green Infrastructure Mapping Guide. 
And this mapping guide was developed by NOAA to specifically help spatial analysts develop a GIS work plan to prioritize green infrastructure for resilience to coastal flooding and sea level rise. Um, and though, um, again, as I said, that the audience for this is a spatial analyst, specifically uh, spatial analysts that are new to mapping green infrastructure for resilience to coastal hazards, though a lot of the content in here, I believe, would be um, valuable to a broader audience. Um, again, this is specific to prioritizing land, landscape features for green infrastructure with that focus on protective benefits for coastal resilience, um, as opposed to other types of conservation mapping approaches that might focus upon biodiversity and habitat. Um, again, we're talking about the a landscape scale product here. And another point I want to make before we move on is that uh, the general GIS approach the approach that we highlight in this guide involves multi-criteria analysis. Um, so I created a kind of simple graphic here just to help you understand. Um, it's a kind of a self-describing term, but to help you understand um, multi-criteria analysis in terms of GIS, you are analyzing multiple criteria individually and then adding the results for a final uh, final output. So. Um, we're talking about mapping here, so each of these w layers that we see, or each of these graphics represents a different layer, an output from mapping um, from a separate individual analysis, um, and then you add those together to create one final output. You add all of the values from these analyses together to get that final output, and this is a multi-criteria analysis. Um, and this will make a little bit more sense as we uh, continue the tour into the mapping guide. And so with that, we will actually go live and here we are, okay. And so here we are looking at the actual home page of the Green Infrastructure Mapping Guide and we'll open the guide, launch it here, asks you if you want to resume where you left off, if you have happened to have visited there already. Um, and here we are on the intro screen, and it basically says here at the top, it basically says that this guide supports spatial analysts mapping green infrastructure for coastal resilience, and that it will help them incorporate GI, green infrastructure strategies, into a, into a GIS work plan to prioritize green infrastructure for their study area. Um, so I've thrown the, the term work plan out a few times, and that's probably not an entirely familiar term. Um, it's basically a documentation of all of the, the GIS work that is to, to be done for a project. Okay, and then notice the bold words that are here in the center of the screen. These actually highlight um, some of the features. So you can follow along in the, the work plan view. Um, again, the work plan is the documentation of the, the GIS work. It's uh, kind of like a blueprint for a building, if you want to think about that analogy. And so we've organized the, organized the content of this mapping guide within uh, the work plan layout. And the work plan is uh, generally a, a table format. Um, so you can follow along, uh, follow along and, and view the content and complementary information along within this um, work plan layout. And at each step, you can access information about case studies and detailed guidance. And additionally, throughout the guide, there are jo job aids available, like worksheets and templates, as well as links to related resources. And then finally, notice at the bottom of the screen here that we have this video that's embedded. And we have repurposed an animation on ecosystem services and placed it here for users unfamiliar with GI or green infrastructure. Okay, so. Let's get started. So here we are within the, the mapping guide and we're looking at the work plan view. You can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about when it's kind of laid out as a, as a table. Um, it's set up like a work plan table and across the top here we have uh, the different steps. And um, these are kind of the different pieces of, of information that are collected for the work, work plan. And I'm gonna walk you through these steps and uh, also in this view beneath each one of these steps we have information that's provided and we actually uh, have created a, a hypothetical project to help exemplify points throughout this guide and so underneath each of these steps we have um, information examples from that hypothetical project to help get the points across so let me help uh, let me walk you through these steps 
So number one, we have the write, write the GIS goal, and this defines the individual analyses. I'm sorry, this is, um, this is the GIS mission statement where you are defining what will be created to inform prioritization of target areas. So if we read the example here, create a spatial layer that locates and prioritizes healthy wetlands along the state's coast that can provide Uh, it's simple, it's generic, it's hypothetical, but it's feasible. Um, moving on to the next uh, next step is write the mapping objectives, and this is what defines the indiv individual analyses for prioritizing um, objectives. So these are things that are measurable and things that you want to prioritize within the landscape. Um, so for example, um, if you look at number two, uh, We've got locate healthy wetlands. Okay. Um, again, thinking back to that graphic I showed, where we had the four different four different layers that were added up to create the final output, the multi-criteria analysis. You can think of each one of these representing um, one of those layers, one of those in, um, outputs from analyses. And you read this from this point forward. You read this. Uh, horizontally as you're looking across the table. So information here in this next column corresponds with number one and so forth. Um, the next step is assign spatial criteria, and this is where you want to define the specific characteristics to map for each objective. Um, so again, if we look at the example for number two, locate healthy wetlands, um, here we have used size as a proxy for health, because we said salt and freshwater wetlands uh, of at least eight hectares in size. Okay, so we use, use size as a proxy for health, which is an imperfect assumption, but we're intentionally keeping it simple here. Okay, and so um, to advance to the next steps, you click this arrow, it'll take you to the next group of three steps. There are only six total. Um, we have number four, which is gather data. It's pretty straightforward. That's where you assess and acquire available data to support the mapping objectives. Um, and of course, you do that for each mapping objective. We see the corresponding information below. Um, number five is outline analyses. This is where you summarize the geospatial analyses. Basically, the tools or methods that you're going to use in GIS to tease out those spatial you want to be able to isolate. Um, realistically, the full documentation for, uh, for your analyses, for your methods, would likely be organized in a separate document just because of the bulk of information, but this provides initial dire direction and later provides a quick reference. And scoring system is number six. Uh, for most of your analyses, you'll actually end up with a, a selection of features that meet the criteria to varying degrees. So you'll want to rank the results. Oftentimes, you'll want to rank the results according to how well the different areas meet the criteria. So again, returning to our example here where we were looking at size, um, as we go through that analysis, we might end up with a selection of features that range, have a range of sizes, and we want to give emphasis to the larger areas, and you can do that by applying a scoring system like this. Okay, um, and again, remember this is, uh, this is all under the framework of a, a multi-criteria analysis so that you can actually um, add these scores back up, add all these scores together for your final output. Okay, so with all of that, uh, that, those are our six steps. I just want to take you into individual steps here. Um, so you can actually click on these step titles and it'll take you into more information as it tells us here in the bold print. Click on the steps to access more information. We'll follow the directions. And here we are looking at the information for the first step, which is the write the GIS goal. Again, this is where your GIS mission statement um, we can see that we have more useful information about this step that's provided. Um, we also have reference to that hypothetical, uh, hypothetical project that we've created um, to provide examples. So we have reference to that within the context of this step. Um, and then also within each step, you have access to detailed guidance. So these buttons across the bottom, you have more detailed guidance in the step guidance, uh, resources, as well as um, information about actual green infrastructure projects or case studies. And we'll take a look at each one of these. So first we'll open up the step guidance, okay? And then here we can see that it opens a window for more detailed guidance for that particular step. 
Um, for example, you know, there's information here. For example, in the second paragraph, it says, make sure you clearly understand the overall project goals. And then it goes on and links us off to project goal guidance. Uh, guidance. If you click on that, it opens up another window where it provides a little bit more information, including a list of the type of information that a spatial analyst would need to be able to effectively map for a, a project like this. Okay, so we'll back out and uh, at the bottom we'll check out the next button, which is the worksheets and resources. As you might suspect, it links off to some worksheets and resources. Uh, across the top it says field experts and stakeholders may be more familiar with data options, so take advantage of their knowledge. Just lots of little nuggets of guidance like that embedded throughout. Um, and then we, it links off to a starter checklist and a project goal guidance worksheet. So each one of these, if you click upon them, um, they'll be downloaded, downloaded automatically. And then if we go to the case studies tab here, you see that you can choose a case study to see how they approach this step. So we have, um, we have three case studies that are available that we've integrated into the mapping guide. And uh, they are, you know, each of these different I, um, thumbnails links off to these different case studies, and uh, I'll speak to them individually first. So we have the the Maryland. Well, this is a, this first one highlights a project from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, um, where they did mapping conservation priorities for sea level rise adaptation in Maryland, of course, and essentially they were uh, trying to identify wetland adaptation areas. Number two here is from this highlights work from the Trust for Public Land where they're identifying green infrastructure for coastal protection in Jamaica Bay and Staten Island, New York. And then finally, the third one highlights work from the Nature, Nature Conservancy that they did for the Coastal Resilience Tool in Connecticut and New York. So it's prioritizing wetlands that are protecting people and places from coastal hazards in New York and Connecticut. So we'll open up one of these. And again, as I mentioned, it will just show um, it'll show information that corresponds to the step that we're looking at. So we're in step one. This shows, shows us information about the GIS goal for this project. In this case, they wanted to develop a GIS model that will evaluate multiple criteria to locate and prioritize future coastal wetland areas under this scenario of 1.04 meters of sea level rise by 2100. And to do that, to target for land acquisition as part of the state's sea level rise adaptation strategy. It's a mouthful, but that's, that's the goal that they were operating under. Um, and then it provides a little bit of background information. So I'm not going to go into each one of those, but I just wanted to um, just wanted to give you a, an idea of the kind of information that's provided. And then also, if you'll notice here, that you, you can click upon this to go see the full case studies and supporting documents. So we have information about the case studies embedded into the, each of the individual steps, but you can also Come, come to this particular window, and you can download the full case study and the full work plan. Uh, so first, I'll show you a GIS work plan so you can see the, the real deal with information in it here. So we're looking at the GIS work plan. We've standardized a, a for each of these projects and put all the, the project information into this table. We're looking at this one for the, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources um, Wetland Adaptation Project. And you can see across the top the GIS goal, the overarching GIS goal, mapping objectives, spatial criteria, data, analysis, scoring, all that information, all the steps we talked about are collecting these pieces of information. Um, this particular pro project, they actually had nine mapping objectives, and you can see all that information represented here. So that is uh, an actual work plan. And then, um, as I mentioned, you can link off to see a full write-up of the case study as opposed to getting the, the pieces of in information embedded throughout. You, you can get the, the full story, the full narrative in one document here. You can see it provides background information, um, gets in the GIS goal. Um, here we actually kind of lump some of the information just, uh, for, just for the ease of reading, but mapping objectives, spatial criteria, and data, just some background information there. And then we place that in a table along with some additional notes that are useful. Um, as you scroll down, then we have also lumped analysis scoring and maps. Look at there, after all this talking about mapping guide, we finally see a map, right? Um, but here you can see uh, all the information that uh, relates to these steps here. Um, so it makes a, a very ins for a very insightful um, piece of reading.
if you will. And then scroll all the way down, you can see uh, for each of the projects we have results on how or information on how the results are being used. And we also have the work plan uh, table embedded within that document as well. So you can, it just has all of that great information in one document. Okay, so if I return to the work plan, I'm just going to take you uh, quickly through one more step so you can uh, really understand the, the detail and organization here. Um, this is number three, assign the spatial criteria, again, mapping those characteristics across the landscape. And you can see that we have you know, more useful information. Um, we have uh, referenced that example project throughout here. If you get in the step guidance, we have um, information about spatial criteria, spatial considerations for green infrastructure strategies, such as considering area, proximity, and connectivity. It tells us here if we click upon this, you can get even more information. We'll follow the directions, and there we see we can see information about area, proximity, and connectivity. Um, and then again, in the worksheets and resources, we have a link to a worksheet that will provide uh, some guidance for questions to ask stakeholders and, uh, and experts within your area to help you formulate your spatial criteria. And then finally, in the case studies, if we go in the, the, um, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, you can see that we have um, spatial criteria. So it's just information that uh, corresponds to this particular step for this particular project. Okay, and we will uh, return to the work plan. Last two things I want to show you quickly. Uh, we've seen lots of views and lots of um, linkage. We can tell that there are lots of uh, linkages across the, the content pages here. If you go to this menu drop down, you can actually revisit any of these views we've seen here. So the intro, this is the work plan view, the work plan steps where you can navigate crosswise, and then finally the full case studies window. Um, and then all of the resources that are embedded within this uh, mapping guide, you can also access from this resources drop-down menu. Okay, so um, with that, I would like to uh, return, with the time I have left, I'd like to return to the PowerPoint and just quickly um, cover a few more um, green infrastructure-related products that we have available. Um, the first up is the Guide to Assessing Green Infrastructure Costs and Benefits for Flood Reduction. And we heard over and over that people needed to be able to justify implementing green infrastructure to reduce flood impacts. They needed information about the common options pursued and the cost and benefit breakdowns. So to answer these questions, we worked with Toledo, Ohio, and Duluth, Minnesota, and the Eastern Research Group to conduct an economic assessment of green infrastructure specifically to reduce flooding impacts in those locations. And Toledo, Ohio has chronic basement flooding issues, whereas Duluth has, is dealing with extreme velocity of floodwaters during rain events due, their, due to their steep topography. So these are two very different locations, two different, very different um, flooding issues. And so to help folks use the same methods in their community to do this type of assessment, we created this step-by-step -step guide. Um, the guide offers key considerations, recommended expertise, case studies, practical implementation tips, and lessons learned. The next thing I'd like to highlight um, is this training. Uh, this is for, for communities that are looking to increase awareness and understanding of in green infrastructure for resilience. We provide a one-day instructor-led training called Introducing Green Infrastructure for Coastal Resilience. The course teaches about green infrastructure concepts and benefits, techniques that can be implemented at the various scales, um, information about existing planning processes that could incorporate green infrastructure, and it highlights on-the-ground projects um, in the particular area where the training is hosted. It's really a great, uh, really a great course, and Lauren is one of the expert trainers for this. Okay, two more slides. Uh, the last product that I'll highlight was developed as a communication resource. We heard from many coastal managers that they needed help communicating about green infrastructure and the benefits it provides. So we created this animated video. It's less than five minutes long, and it's available on our website. It's really a great resource that can help communicate these concepts to local officials. This is a screen grab of the first scene. The animation also focuses on green infrastructure that provides storm protection. And then here are some other screen grabs that show the animation providing information about existing green infrastructure found in a coastal environment that can provide storm protection for great gray infrastructure or developed areas. 
And within the animation, you can click on each of the natural areas that are highlighted to get more information. Also, you may recall uh, a video was embedded in the intro page of the green, the green Infrastructure Mapping Guide, and it was actually this animation that we had repurposed for that location. So with that, I'd like to remind you that all of the resources that we've shown today are available from our Green Infrastructure Topics page. The URL, URL is available there. Um, and then I'd like to thank you and turn it back over to Sarah or whoever's moderating questions. Okay, it's me, it's Sarah. All, All right. right, thanks guys. Um, <clears throat> so we have a lot of great questions. I'm not sure we'll get to everything, but uh, Lauren and, and David's contact information is right there. So um, we'll start with a couple questions for Lauren. Um, uh, uh, several of the questions are about where the um, coastal exposure flood mapper is currently um, targeted at, Lauren, and, and where it's going to go in the future. So there are some questions as to when it'll get to the West Coast. Um, also, as to whether Louisiana, uh, if that's uh, available at all, or is it available in a beta version? So um, thanks, Sarah. So the West Coast, right now, it's right now the tool is only available for the East Coast and Gulf of Mexico, but this year we're going to be talking about expansion. So we're trying to kind of assess where the needs are. If folks on the West Coast would like something like this, or same with Great Lakes, Pacific Islands, Caribbean. So it's not at the West Coast yet. We don't exactly know when that would be, um, or if we'll expand. I think. Um, it'd be great to hear if there's a need to have it on the West Coast. We're trying to document all the needs that we hear, and then hopefully that can help guide us where to go next. So please, um, you can email me your, you know, any input you have on expansion, and if there's um, a potential use for it in a different area, we'd love to hear about that. And I'll just note, too, that David is also helped work on the mapper, and he was actually like our data. He produced, you know, helped put all the data in the mapper, um, so he can, he can ask a lot of, or answer a lot of the questions as well. Um, and then for Louisiana, it is a, uh, right now it is in the mapper, but not all of the data layers are available. So we're working on updating um, Louisiana now that we we've just recently um, received the the sea level rise scenario layer for Louisiana. So we'll be updating that and in, into that um, for that state. And David, I don't know if there were other. Um, data layers that are missing from Louisiana. No, those were the two, Lauren, and, and uh, okay. we hope to have we hope to have those incorporated by the end of the calendar year. Thanks. Okay, great. Hopefully that um, also, the, well, and one uh, I didn't know is there um, is Puerto Rico included? Not currently. So that's another one. Um, we, we've heard before that Puerto Rico, they might have a need for the tool. So if folks have specific ideas on how they, you know, how they might use the tool or just if there's a need, send it, please email us and let us know. Um, again, so we can try to direct our efforts in the right areas. Okay, and someone had asked how they share their input, and I just uh, reiterate that the e their email addresses, uh, Lauren and David's, are, are, are right there. So yeah. uh, go ahead and email them. Um, there will also be some comments. I'll send you the, the questions that we're getting here through the interface, so we'll, that will also Perfect. be available. Um, let's see. Well, so a couple other questions. Um, oh, there's a lot of good ones. Um, okay, does your sea level rise... Do your sea level rise models consider underlying geologic rise or subsidence? David, do you have a good answer for that one? Not, not really. No, these are those are based on um, a modified bathtub approach, if you will. So um, it it accounts for um, localized sea level rise, so relative sea level rise. Um, based on the, well, no, I guess that's not really true. Um, I apologize, I'm amending my, my answer, but it, it does not. So those, those data are from our sea level rise viewer, um, and that's a great location. They have a, a great FAQ, so if you have more uh, detailed questions about the sea level rise data, that's a great place to go and, and dig in. Um, but th they do not fully account for um, you know, local ge geologic forces. Thanks, David. Okay, got that. Um, let's see. Um, does does the tool account for wetlands and other features that can reduce sur surge penetration? 
Well, the the mapper includes like in the in the ecosystem exposure maps, you can see different, you know, you can see wetlands and other natural areas in open space, and you can overlay different hazards on top of that to see how they could reduce hazard impacts. If that, I don't know if that's the question, um, but there's not there's not marsh migration modeling is not included in the mapper. So if you wanted to see how marshes might respond to sea level rise, the place to go for that would be our sea level rise viewer that does have a marsh tab and can and, and looks at, you know, different sea level rise scenarios and how marshes might react. Um, that's a question. David, I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, just a little bit, but uh, within this tool, we mostly compiled data from other sources, so we didn't create the sea level rise, I mean, the um, storm surge data here that was actually um, created from slosh modeling um, so that's sea um, surges over land, lake, ocean, and <laughs> gosh, of course I'd fail an acronym now. Um, but but anyways, that that's from modeling that does account for the land cover in a particular area, and um, but but we didn't make those data, so we're just uh, okay. we're leveraging what's available. It's sea, lake, and overland surges Thank from you. hurricanes model. That's it, yeah. yeah. I, I, I Google was my friend. Okay, <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, thank you guys. Um, and there, we're getting a lot more specific questions, so I'd, I'd encourage you to uh, contact uh, contact these guys directly. Okay, um, a couple more quick questions about uh, coastal exposure flood mapper. Um, can you select municipal boundaries? So currently, you can we just have county boundaries in the tool, but you can zoom in to whatever boundary you'd like. So there's not municipal boundaries in the tool, but you can zoom in however far you'd like or and set your extent. So you can extent, kind of set your own extent, and then whatever maps you save based on it'll be based on whatever extent you've zoomed into on the map. But currently, you can only select um, the counties from the drop down. Okay, and do you have a layer that shows private and public lands? We, we do, do not. not. Okay. All right. Let us All know. Right. Let us know if that's useful. You know, it's good to hear that. You know, input on what's useful and and that sort of thing too. Okay. Great. Uh, well, let's switch gears a little and go to the green infrastructure mapping guide. Um, so there was a question: Which emission scenario or scenarios uh, were used to drive the sea level rise projections? Um, let's see, I guess that's referring to the, the Maryland DNR project that we highlight, and they, it's been a while since I've actually kind of looked back at that story, but um, that, that was the result of several years of work that, that had been going on in that, that area, and Adrian, I mean Adrian, um, Lauren might be a little bit more familiar on the back story, but I know that they actually had kind of a, a science um, technical advisory group that did research on um, some down, downscaled modeling, and, and they um, they ended up recommend, uh, recommending a particular, uh, well, two particular um, projections for, for that area. They looked at 2050 and 2100, but they mostly mapped for the projection of 1.04 meters or rise by 2100. Yeah, and I think they maybe used um, the higher emission scenario. They, they used the scenarios that the um, International Panel on Climate Change um, came out with, and I think they might have used their higher emission scenarios for their work, but I'm not positive. It would say the case study probably, probably goes into it a little bit more. Okay, okay, thank you. And let's see, um, are there resources for the sort of numeric values you demonstrated, such as size of wetlands, proximity distances, etc.? Um, I, I don't. There probably are. I mean, that, that's something that we were um, kind of ballpark with, within our example. We were kind of ballparking, and that's that. There's not really a one size fits all kind of number that would be available available for that type of stuff. I don't believe um, it's going to really vary from location to location depending on the the landscape of, of the project. Yeah, and I'll say that we, you know, most of the times when people are doing undertaking one of those projects, we always suggest to them to please involve your local experts. So, 
um, involve your local wetland experts and biologists, and usually that that's who we rely on to come up with those numbers. And if there those experts are in the area, then it would be you know looking into lit, different literature sources and what would be the recommended size um, depending on what your goal is. So you know, uh, what do you want the wetland to do, basically? Yeah. That's great. Thanks for making that point, Lauren. And that is a mantra that we have embedded throughout the mapping guide is just using your, your local expertise. The people, there's probably somebody in and around your area that, that has the answers you're looking for. Okay, great. Um, there are two questions about the multi-criteria analysis. Um, one was just sort of a general question about it, and would it be fair to say that the multi-criteria analysis is similar to a composite map? And then, second of all, do you use weighting for any of the layers in the multi-criteria analysis, or are they added together as of equal importance? Um, yes, I think you could also refer to it as a composite map. There are probably some other synony synonymous terms out there as well that you could apply. Um, and then, as far as the weighting, definitely, you know, that's we, we've kind of presented it in a very simplified fashion just to um, make it easy, easily understood and, and uh, not really add any bulk in the, the content there, but um, there are certainly examples of projects where, um, where people have weighted certain, um, certain results and certain layers in, the, um, in their final output. In fact, I think you would see maybe in the uh, Trust for Public Land, that second case study, they, they may have um, counted one of their layers and multiplied it by two in the final summation or something like that, but certainly that is not uncommon. Okay. Okay, good to know. Um, are there any case studies of the green infrastructure mapper underway dealing with dune or beach systems? No, there are not currently. And that's, we, we have those three right now, and that's something that we hope to um, expand upon as we uh, become aware of other uh, relevant green infrastructure projects, mapping projects that are related to um, flood hazard reduction, flood impact reduction. So. Currently, the answer is no, but we hope to um, to broaden our suite of case studies that we have. Okay, and let's see, what is the cost for the one-day course, and where is it given? I and can answer that one. No, go ahead. Okay. And this more, was for which which wait which tool? This is for the um, coastal exposure flood mapper. That's probably this, for the green green infrastructure. Oh, training. for the green. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the training is a one-day, a full-day course, and the cost is free unless um, you, we basically we work with local hosts to to host the course. So, if they need to cover expenses for the building or food or something like that, there might be a small uh, a small fee, but we don't charge to bring the course to a location. Um, and generally, how it goes is a local host will contact me, and we just kind of discuss their needs, see if the course is a good fit. Um, based on what they're looking to do, and um, then we just work with them to kind of host the course, and they invite folks that are local, and we also work with them to have, um, to get local speakers lined up, so that we have a lot of local examples of green infrastructure on the ground. But feel free to contact me if you want some more information about the course. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, we'll do two more quick ones, and this is back to the uh, Coastal Exposure Flood Mapper. Um, are states on the East Coast and Gulf of Mexico being encouraged to use the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper when updating their coastal zone management plans? Um, I mean, we're making it available to folks. We're not telling folks they like have to use it or anything like that. So this is just a resource for them to use um, if they want to start conversations in their communities about coastal flood risk, um, you know, and they can obviously use it looking at um, state coastal management plans. It is a screening level tool though, so making sure that it's appropriate for um, the area that you're looking at um, and that sort of thing. And if there's better local data sets to, you know, make sure we, we encourage folks to use those. But um, definitely people are encouraged to use it, but it's not by any means, you know, required in any updates. Okay, and last question. Um, this was back to the public versus private lands. Um, can only maps be saved, or can the GIS la data layers be downloaded uh, to enable viewing the information with a public versus private lands data, for example? So the maps can be saved and printed, and, and you know the URLs and saved and that sort of thing. And that, but if then if someone wants just the individual data layer outside of the tool. They, you basically, we provide the map service, so that's how you can view it online. 
if you have a desktop GIS and you actually want the layer to put bring into a GIS and analyze it, we provide the authoritative source to get to download it. And that's because a lot of the data in there is not ours. So um, we're, we're kind of routing people to where the authoritative source is to get the data set. Um, but of course, it's view, the single data sets are viewable, viewable by map service um, or the maps can be saved. But as far as downloading the actual data, you have to go to the authoritative source, which okay. is sometimes us, but a lot of times other people. So. Okay. Um. Well, great. Well, we actually got through most of it, although there were some questions we didn't uh, manage to get to, and I'll send you those along to you guys. But thank you so much. This was a great presentation, and obviously tremendous interest in the tools. Um, so I hope there's lots of connections made, and, and good luck to everyone with their work. And thank you again, uh, Lauren and David. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, Thanks, everybody. everyone, for joining us. Okay. And I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Likewise. Bye, Bye everybody.